So we're talking about the church defined. We're continuing in this series, and I just want to go back and summarize what we've discussed over the last several weeks, and it's this. The, the necessary components of the church are Jesus, Him coming to live among us to reveal the fullness and the glory of God to come and to save humanity, the one who came to live, the one who came and died, and the one who is raised from the dead. We have to have Jesus a part of this. That's the beginning. And then the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God moving in, in those who have professed faith in Christ, who have agreed to believe in Jesus. And so those are the components that are necessary for the church. And words have meaning. Even as Marcy was praying, she, she corrected herself because we have this idea that, that this is the church. This is a building. This is simply a building. We are the church. Those on the line with us are the church. Those who believe in Jesus are the church. And so we're moving, into, uh, we're moving into a passage of Scripture that I think is vital for us right now. It's vital for the church, but it's vital for the church now. I think it's been a disregarded component of the church that we need to look at and we need to really wrestle with. We need to pray about. We need to seek. We need to research. We need to find out about this. And what it is is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Holy Spirit coming and settling upon the apostles. And through that, they went out and they spoke in languages they didn't know. And people came to know Jesus through the fact that they actually activated the Holy Spirit within them. And what we need to understand is at salvation, if you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit has descended and now dwells within you. But it doesn't mean that every one of us walk in the Spirit. It doesn't mean that we pray in the Spirit, as Paul talks about. It doesn't mean that we live our life according to the Spirit. There are some of us who are believers in Jesus. The Holy Spirit lives in us, and yet He is grieved, or He is quenched, or He has been stopped. For some reason, something in us. There's an entire part of the church that are called cessationists. And that group of the church, of whom I have friends who, who fall in this theological camp, I have friends who believe this way, I love them, but cessationists believe that the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit has ceased. And now the dispensation or the particular part of history that we're in right now is the church. I'm not a believer of that. I believe that God has chosen to work through His church and by working through his church, it's through the spiritual gifts that he gives everyone who believes in Jesus. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and he says something very similar to what we need to hear. He says in chapter 12, verse 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, or that word can actually mean just things. Now concerning spiritual things, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And so what I want to say today is I, I just want us to talk. And I want you to know that as we're moving through chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, we're going to be coming back and we're going to be unpacking the specific spiritual gifts next week. And so we're going to roll over part of this passage and you're going to go, why aren't we talking about this? We're going to be discussing that next week. But what I want us to do is lay a foundation of what the church is supposed to be, not only in this time, but for us. And so I want us to be informed, so let's have a talk. Paul says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So Paul looks at these people, and before we get into that, I want to say this. This is Paul writing this. This is a very, a very orthodox Jewish man at one point who's writing about the spiritual gifts of which he did not adhere to prior to encountering Jesus. So he had to have a complete transformation, a complete change of mind, complete change of heart. And so this is the man who's writing this to the church. And so he says, you once were pagans. When you were pagans, you were led by mute idols. And it says... And yes, you were led. What that, what, it, what that actually means in the Greek is you were led and you are continually being led. What he's saying to these people in the Corinthian church 
is you've stepped away from idolatry, but you continue in some of the practices of idolatry. What I think this says to us is what's interesting in the culture of the Corinthian church is they weren't adverse to spiritual things. In fact, they had adhered to spiritual things even when they were pagans. But I think the issue with us is we've almost disregarded spiritual things. We worship the God of all creation, the one who set everything in place. We worship the God who sent Jesus to come and to live among us and to die. And we serve the one who said that I'm going to send my spirit and he's going to come and he's going to dwell within you. So we should be the most spiritual people. And yet I think in our culture, because we're bright and because we're more intelligent than the previous generations that have come before us, we've made the decision that certain components and parts of following Jesus are no longer necessary or important. And I want to say to us this morning, the things of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit are vital to the church. So that's what we're going to step into today. And the last thing I want to say in regard to how Paul kind of opened this part of of his letter to the Corinthian church is this. He said, you cannot say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. You can't declare that Jesus is Lord. That was a confession of faith in the early church. That was almost a battle cry. That was a war cry saying Jesus is Lord. And what it meant was that it is going against everything of culture. It's going against everything of the mute idols. It's going against everything in regard to the Egyptian Pharaoh, the one who's in charge, the Roman government. It's going against everything that is present within culture. And it's saying Jesus is above everything else. Y'all, the only way that you and I can live that that confession of faith is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are not capable in and of ourselves to declare that and to mean it except for the Holy Spirit living in us. And then we declare Jesus is Lord. Jesus is above all. Jesus is ruler of my life. He's the one who came to rescue me. He's the one who came to save me. And he's the one that is necessary in my life. Jesus is Lord. And I just want you to ask the question, do you declare that? In the morning when you wake up, do you declare, Jesus is Lord, not me, not my boss, not my work, not my my idols, none of those things, Jesus is Lord. Do Do you wake up in the morning with that certainty? And there's some of us, I believe, sitting in this room and online right now, who at one point woke up with that certainty, but something's transpired, something's happened in your life, and you don't live in that right now. And I just want to say that that's where we have to be. Jesus is Lord. So Paul continues. He says in verse 4, Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. What, what Paul is doing is he's bringing together the Trinity. Do you see it in there? He talks about Spirit, he talks about Lord, and he talks about Father. He talks about God. And so you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit within, encompassed in this one part. And what Paul is saying is all three in one are the ones that empower these gifts in you. It's the Spirit of God that empowers these gifts in you. You don't create them in and of yourself. And you and I have certain talents and abilities, but we're not talking about the natural talents and abilities that you may have. We're talking about unique gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit for the purposes of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God is the one who places these in us. If you go over into verse 11, it says the Spirit of God is the one who empowers these and he apportions these as he wills. These are the Spirit's gifts. They're just offered to us. And one of the difficult things that I've seen in the church is the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been abused and they've been misused. And usually that happens Because people take ownership of the gifts. They think, oh, that's my gift. I'm going to do whatever I want to do with that gift. And what happens then is it's no longer the gift of the Spirit. It's the gift of the person. And I promise you it will not carry the power or the authority that the gifts of the Spirit carry. It is the Spirit of God 
that brings these gifts. Now, I have to stop right here and say this. Just as we said about uh, what Paul said to this Corinthian church is saying, you once were pagans and you did spiritual things and you're continuing to be led by those at times. But let me explain to you, let me inform you of what the spiritual gifts are. It says to us that even though you may or may not believe in the spiritual gifts given by the Holy Spirit, doesn't make them less true. So we need to make a decision this morning. Either we believe this or we don't. We're moving forward as if we believe it. But that's something that you're going to have to wrestle with. You're going to have to wrestle with because as we walk through this, you're going to listen to some of these things, especially next week as we break them down. You're going to listen to some of the things in regard to the spiritual gifts and you're going, that's weird. That's just really odd. I don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if I can wrap my mind around it. And the truth of the matter is you can't. These are things of the spirit, not things of the flesh. These are not things that you and I contrive and create within us. Either we believe in this or we don't. And yet Jesus said, it's better for you that I leave. So I send my spirit, my helper, to accomplish these very things through us. And so then Paul goes on, and this is the part he says in verse 7, to each is given the manifestation, the revelation, the, 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 the perceived uh, experience of the Spirit for the common good. Y'all, the reason these gifts are given are not for us. The reason these gifts are given is not so that we can be certain in who we are in Christ, so we can be certain that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, although those things are true. The reason these gifts are given is for the purposes of the common good of the body of Christ, the church. It's for the common good. The reason God places his Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit in you are for the people around you. So when you get up after we get done with, with this worship experience this morning, when you get up, I want you to look at everyone around you because the reason God has given you unique spiritual gifts are, is for the people around you in the church. That's why you have it. That's why you have these gifts. For the common good. If you go over in chapter 14, Paul says that these gifts are to build up, to edify, to correct, to educate the church. That's why these are here. They're vital for the church to continue to grow and become exactly what the church is supposed to become. But it's through the Holy Spirit in us. So Paul goes on and he begins to lay out a variety of these gifts. For to one is given, the, uh, given through the Spirit the utterance of the wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of the healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So those are the ones, those are the, the gifts of the Spirit that we're going to talk about next week. But I want to say something. Paul references the gifts of the Spirit in a multitude of places. Peter references the work of the Spirit. And, and I just want to say, these are not comprehensive lists. I don't believe it's Paul's purpose to lay out everything and say, these are specifically only the gifts of the Spirit. But he lays out a significant number of the gifts of the Spirit. And so then he goes into this and he, he, he moves into an analogous uh, understanding. Verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to, think, to drink of one spirit. What he's saying is this. He goes into this analogy of the body. All of us can understand it because all of us have the body. And he's saying there are many members to the body, but there's only one body. I love the fact that we move into this because if you are a member of the church, if you're a member of New Song, it doesn't mean that you have a membership. It means that you are a member of the body. It means that you are a significant part of the body. I've been going through some procedures lately. And so I'm like, I want to go find out some more things about my body that I've completely forgotten. And as I began to do some research into the body, I am amazed that anyone can sit back really looking at the body and say there is no God. 
The fact that stuff goes, I mean, just as a side note, um, I just want to say, get a colonoscopy. <laughs> just want to say that. I'm not stepping into your space and some of you are shaking your head no. Get one anyway, or two or three like me. But anyway, but I looked at the body and I looked at the, the, the large intestine and the small intestine. And I looked at, at the stomach and I looked at everything that, that goes into that and how nutrition gets into the body through all these forms. Y'all, there, no, there, is, there is no part of the body that is not vital. And there's no part of the body of Christ that is not vital. Every one of us are vital. And some of you, some of you are just the little toe. And that's okay. We need a little toe. Do you know the little toe brings balance to your life? How many of us need a little toe in our life? Can I get away? I mean, come on. Anyway, I need a little toe. You may just be a little toe, but all the parts of the body are necessary just as you are. And that's what Paul's saying. But he said, we need to be united as one. Do you know where we're united? We're united in Jesus and we're united in baptism. Baptism in water and baptism by fire, by the Holy Spirit. Those are all the same. Uh, just as I said, the Holy Spirit comes on us when we make a decision to submit our lives to Jesus. That's when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. But we are united in Jesus and united in baptism. Do you know what that means? That means that we're not going to think alike. That means that there are going to be parts of life that we're not going to agree. There are going to be parts of life that we're going to look at and go, I don't necessarily see that the way you do. You know what? That's okay. Because the beautiful thing about being a part of the body of Christ is you don't lose your uniqueness. You don't even lose your individuality. And there are a lot of people who are like, it just, he just kind of throws us in this mass of flesh and just kind of this, this blob. No, your uniqueness, your individuality is essential to the unity of of the body of Christ. You are vital. So when the Holy Spirit puts these gifts in you, it is imperative that you participate in the body of Christ. I just need to let you know, that does not mean showing up on Sunday morning. That would be like the body of Christ coming to worship at one particular hour and then going and sitting on its rear the rest of the week. And that's kind of what the body of Christ does sometimes. So Paul is unpacking this and he's laid it out and he said, the central place is baptism through Christ. And then he goes on and he says, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And then he goes on and gives other examples of this. Of this. And I just want to say that you cannot say, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you can't say, I'm not a part of the body. You can't say, I'm not a part of the church. You can't disconnect yourself. That would like the, be like the arm making a decision to go, I don't like this body. I'm going to detach myself and go over here. First of all, can't happen. Secondly, it would die. There are a lot of us that are sitting in this room and that are online right now that are followers of Jesus. But you, for some, in some way, have reasoned it in your mind to say that you can disconnect from the body and you cannot be a part of the body. That is not possible. Because you're still a part of the church. Whether you want to be or not, as flawed as the church is, and it is. There are a lot of people that don't want to see behind the curtain of the great Wizard of Oz. They don't want to see the levers pulled. Y'all, the church is flawed because of us. <laughs> but through the work of the Spirit in us, the church is powerful. And it requires everyone who calls himself Christian. 
Then Paul goes on and he lays out another, an, another idea. He said, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, to the feet. I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And on the unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our most presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What he's saying is, you and I don't have the right to look at other people and go, mm, no, you can't be a part. I know you've never heard that in the church. I know you've never heard that that's even a part of the church, but let me just hypothetically speak about that. If you got somebody who doesn't agree with you, someone who sees something different than you, which is everyone, but if you got somebody like that, you can't say, you don't have the right to say to them, you are not a part of the church. If they believe in Jesus, have been baptized in Jesus' name, and live for Jesus, it is not our right to say and pick and choose who is a part of the church. And it's not our right to pick and choose what gifts we accept and what gifts we do not accept. Because there are people in your life that have certain gifts and you're going to look at them and go, you're kind of weird to me. I've got the really good gifts. I've got the gifts that anyone can understand. I've got the gifts of leadership and administration. And all those. you got that healing gift. I don't get that. So I would really like you not to be a part of my body. Guess what? It's not your body. It's Jesus' body. It's his. You're just a member of it. And then he gets to the end of this. And he says, when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. You know this. When you hit your head, it resonates through your entire body body. Your toe didn't get hit. It was your head, but your toe has pain. Your whole body has pain. That's what should happen in the body because we are interconnected. We are operating within the gifts that God has blessed us with for the common good. We used to have a t-shirt and I, I, I doubted or I debated with myself whether or not to mention this or not. We used to have a t-shirt at the Wesley Foundation, the campus ministry we were involved with. And I wanted to take this phrase, when one suffers, all suffer. When one is honored or rejoices, everybody rejoices. I'm like, that's awesome. And so we had a shirt made. And the shirt said, and, and please forgive me, but the, church, the shirt said, your crap is our crap, your joy is our joy. Here's what it means. It means when you are suffering, when you're going through difficult things, we suffer with you. But here's what it also means. It also means that the spirit that, is, that has placed gifts in you, when another part of the body is suffering, you, being at a point of health, have the ability to breathe life into that part of the body because you're operative, you're functioning but if you're not functioning and a part of the body is suffering, the possibility of that part of the body continuing to suffer is there because you're not operative within the functionality of the entire body of Christ. And then we get to rejoice together. I used to have people on campus, they would walk up and they would see the shirt and they're like, oh, that's cool. You know, you're, you're and I'm like, it's a whole shirt. you got to read the whole shirt. So I would turn around, and on the back of it, it says, your joy is our joy. It's everything. Do you know what that means? That means that you and I have to be involved in one another's life, like we talked about last week with Acts 2, 41 through 47. We have to know one another. We have to commit ourselves to this fellowship, this partaking, participating in the life of one another. Y'all, church is not meant that we are separated and we're doing our own thing and I have my membership and I come and I sit down and I get for my membership, I get my popcorn and I sit there and whatever my membership gives me for that Sunday is good and then I walk out. No, it is not membership. It is a part of the body. You are significant to be operating as a part of the body. 
And that's what we're going to be breaking down. If you go to the last part of this, Paul steps back into talking about what these various gifts are. He says, And God is appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administration, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Uh, are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. I love that last phrase. Are you desiring the higher gifts? Are you desiring the bigger gifts that you can't control? Because you and I can sit here and go, oh, I have the gift of administration because I administrate well. What about the gifts of healing? What about the gifts of miracles? Isn't it amazing that he separates gifts of healing and gifts of miracles and you're just sitting there going, what is that? Is there anybody else that sits there and go, what, is, what, is the mir- what are the miracles? But the gifts of the Spirit are in you. If you follow Jesus, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you are someone who has submitted your life to Jesus, the gifts of the Spirit are in you. Are you operating in them? Do you even know what they are? Paul talks about them over in Romans 12. And I... I love the fact because he runs through a very similar thing saying that God gives or God apportions these gifts so that we can do the work of the kingdom. And then he says this, so do the work. Put them into practice. He uses the phrase, if teaching, then teach. And there's some of us going, I don't know what they are. I don't know. Have, have Have you sought it out? Have you desired the greater gifts? Have you prayed for the greater gifts? Have you sat there and said, okay, God, your word says that you give me spiritual gifts. I'm not really seeing them right now. I'm I'm coming to you. I'm asking you, reveal these to me. Show these to me. Because I want to be a part of the body of Christ. Do you know why we need to not be uninformed of the spiritual things? It's because we were created for this. If you go over into Ephesians 2, verse 10 in particular, it says that God, a long time ago, created certain things for you to do, for you are his workmanship, to go out and to reveal and show the glory of God. One thing that we need to see in this passage of Scripture with the body of Christ, do we realize that as the body of Christ operates together, so there is no division, so is, so there is unity and diversity, so that we see this, do we realize that what the world sees when the body of Christ is operating together, this massive, beautiful person, But what if we're not operating together? What if we as members have separated ourselves and we're just choosing to be inactive? It's like you walk out on the football field and you walk out and you have a helmet on and you have pads on and everything and you kind of stand over the sideline and then in the middle of the game, you just kind of come to your senses and go, no, I don't want to play. And you start taking your pads off and you go up in the stands and you just kind of plop down and Joe's standing beside you going, what are you doing up here? You're supposed to be down there. So how many of us truly believe in Jesus, have submitted our lives to Jesus, say that we're following Jesus, Jesus tells us, I have sent my spirit to dwell within you. And then Paul expounds upon that saying, and he has given us gifts to be used for the common good, to build up the church, to edify the church. And we're like, yeah, I really don't want to have a part of that. Y'all here, here's my plea. If you believe in Jesus, if you're following Jesus, we need you. We need, we need you to step into who God's created you to be. Your purposes, your uniqueness, your individuality, not individualism, your individuality. So that we can have unity and diversity. I need you. I need you in my life. I need you as a part of the body of Christ, active. 
I just think of the analogy of the body and this idea that maybe you're a finger, but you say, no, I don't want to play. And so you lift up your hand and all your other fingers work except that one. And you're like, what? what's the deal? Because you're making a choice not to live and walk in the Spirit. I really encourage you, don't miss next week. Because we're going to unpack what these gifts are so that we can understand more fully who we're called to be. One other thing that we want to get in front of you is a spiritual gifts test that can help lead you and guide you in this. And so on our website, newsoncommunity.church, you'll see a card on there and it says spiritual gifts. And you can go click on that button and you can go take a spiritual gifts test free of charge. It'll give you results. It'll show you what your top spiritual gifts are. And so you can go and take that test And what I really would ask of y'all sitting in here as well as online is go take the test and bring your results back with you next week as we walk through these various gifts of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, there's so many things in the church that we're never going to fully understand. And for me, you may fully understand spiritual gifts really well and you and I need to talk. But there's certain things in the church that we're not going to fully understand, and yet it's what the Word of God tells us, and so we lean into it, and we trust it, and we begin to move into it. 